So, um, yeah, for this time in uh, CS 11737, I'm very happy to have uh, Pat Littell, uh, who's a research officer at the uh, National Research Council of Canada. And uh, we know Pat because before he was here uh, at CMU working with us on uh, low resource language processing and other things like this. Um, but now uh, he's working as a research officer doing very uh, interesting things on uh, applying NLP and language technology to indigenous languages, mostly of Canada. And really, you know, we do a lot of research on, you know, low resource language processing and stuff like this, but Pat is really kind of close to the ground and making it actually work for people. And that's really exciting. And because of this, you know, practical considerations for research and development is something that he can speak to much better than, you know, any of the other teachers, uh, instructors in this class. So I'm, I'm really happy to have him here to present about this. And of course, we welcome any questions that you may have or, or things like this uh, as well. So I'll uh, turn it over to, uh, to Pat. Yeah, and if you have a question, shout them out because I tend to go over time <laughs> and there might not be time for questions afterwards. So uh... <clears throat> okay, so who am I? Um, close this out a little bit. So I'm a researcher. Uh, I work for the Canadian federal government. Uh, I live and work in Ottawa, Ontario, uh, which I should mention is on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Um, and the Algonquin Nation is still around. And uh, at the end of this video, um, you'll actually see some work that we've done with them. Um, so I work on the development and promotion of language technologies for Indigenous languages spoken in Canada. And while I do do some product development um, and some research, one important part of my job is actually matchmaking, um, that I survey the current state of language technologies, what the state of the art is, and try to match what's possible with NLP now to the needs that community organizations have. And I accepted to give this talk because I am very interested in the work that you are all doing right now. Um, it's one of the frontiers that I'm keeping a closest eye on. And I'm hoping that by better understanding the issues that I deal with at work, you might take steps to make the kind of breakthroughs that create the kind of systems that I can deploy for people. And we use a lot of CMU technology on the job. Um, you'll see many citations of CMU work in this presentation. So we've already bought into some of your ecosystems. So, um, the, the landmass of Canada, um, the, you know, this landmass here with arbitrary borders uh, contains a very large amount of linguistic diversity. Uh, you, if you compare it to Europe, for example, um, this landmass in Europe are roughly the same size, um, but Europe for the most part has three main language families. And the vast majority of the languages of Europe are in one family, the Indo-European language family. And in the same amount of land, uh, Canada has 10 main language families, uh, unrelated to each other or not provably related to each other. And <clears throat> those language families are divided into about 70 languages. Um, I say roughly here because the question of whether two nearby speech varieties are the same enough to be considered one language or differ enough, different enough to be considered two languages uh, really depends on, the answer to that question changes depending on who you're asking. So if you 
see different numbers of languages spoken in Canada, that's the reason why. And collectively, uh, these are spoken by about a quarter million people. So these are not just languages of the past, these are languages spoken today. But they are at very different levels when it comes to the number of speakers that speak them uh, and the level of vitality of intergenerational transmission. So a few of these languages, for example, Inupitut is the most spoken of the Inuit languages spoken in Canada. And that's still spoken by a majority of the regional population in, for example, the, the uh, territory of Nunavut. And it's still acquired uh, by most children when they grow up. Um, but most of the indigenous languages spoken in Canada are spoken by fewer than 500 first language speakers, most of them very elderly. Um, and a few of these languages are sleeping, that is um, with no living first language speakers. Um, just to note that uh, in Canada, language activists and researchers have kind of moved away from the metaphor of living language versus dead language um, as a metaphor that served its course. Uh, it's, a, it's a good metaphor if you're looking to alarm people about the state of languages. Uh, it's not a very good metaphor if you want to, for example, motivate people um, to keep the language, uh, to wake the language up, for example. And I really need to emphasize. So uh, we, we had one question in the, oh, yeah. in the chat. Uh, the question was how many of the languages are written? Um, all of the languages are written by somebody. Um, they all have sort of official orthographies and writing systems. Um, not everyone who speaks them is literate in them. Uh, so for example, many of the elders would never have during their own schooling uh, learned a writing system for their language and many of them don't write it uh, particularly um, often. Um, so an important thing to note about these languages and the language situation in Canada is these languages did not atrophy due to say natural causes. Um, it, people didn't stop speaking them due to just like economic uh, situations. This was a deliberate program of cultural genocide by the Canadian government and the churches starting in the late 19th century in which children um, often around the age of six were taken from their parents and put into re-education camps uh, called residential schools. And there they were punished for speaking their languages with each other. Uh, they were punished for singing their songs or playing their games or otherwise sharing their cultures. Uh, and because these schools were were staffed in, in part by predators, uh, these, many of these children were subject to severe physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. And this isn't ancient history. Uh, many of these children that you see in these photos are still alive. Um, I've met many of them. Uh, and the last residential school only closed in 1996. Uh, and at the same time as this, there were other attempted uh, ways to attempt to wipe out the languages. For example, the uh, types of ceremonies in which culture was passed down and shared were made illegal by uh, the governments. And uh, as a, these policies were devastating to a generation, to generations, of Canadians and the effects are still felt to this day. Um, but when I say that um, many of these languages are only spoken by a few hundred elders, um, these children are, are, are those elders. Uh, these children were often the last 
generation of speakers that spoke it as a generation from birth. Um, so these are, these are not simply languages that atrophy. These are languages that were forcibly taken from these people. Um, there is now, however, significant interest by young people, uh, often the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren of, of the elders, uh, in learning these languages and in reclaiming the cultures uh, that were taken from them. Teachers, elders, publishers uh, are actually overwhelmed with interest. Uh, I hear from many organizations that there are more students than they can actually serve. And so they're looking for technological solutions to create and deliver educational content to more students. Um, also, indigenous languages are becoming official languages in some provinces and territories. And thus, governments are wanting to publish documents in these languages, provide services in these languages, uh, and otherwise serve the populations. Uh, and so I'd like to emphasize uh, technology and technology research and development isn't the center of the revitalization story. Uh, it's the part of this story that I'm going to talk about because it's what I do for a living. Um, but it's only a tiny slice of what's happening. We at NRC largely see ourselves as support staff for this. Um, but people realize that revitalization efforts are happening in an increasingly technological world. More of our social, educational, and professional lives are being spent online. And COVID-19 has dramatically accelerated these trends. So what technologies um, are requested most by organizations? Um, Unsurprisingly, uh, given the situation, educational technologies usually top the list. Uh, these include things like reference works that are easier to use, assistive technologies that make it easier for beginners to write correctly and fluently, uh, ways for teachers to make engaging educational content and deliver it more widely, um, especially content that incorporate speech. That's a uh, request that we get very frequently. Um, another common requests deal with substantial transcribing or translating workloads. So many communities have hours of untranscribed recordings of fluent speakers. Uh, for example, decades of indigenous language radio broadcasts by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. But the transcription process is very slow and there are relatively few transcribers that communities uh, can rely on. So technologies to accelerate transcription uh, are often near the top of communities technological work list, wish lists. Um, also, uh, translators need to translate documents, and they often have tight turnaround times. Um, this is especially true when the indigenous language is a language of government. It's an important part of democratic transparency to publish what the government is doing in the languages that people speak in that region. So organizations like the government of Nunavut are on the lookout for tools to accelerate translator workloads and also encourage consistency between translators so that two different government documents both use the same terms for the same things. Um, this isn't necessarily machine translation. They might be simpler practical tools like translation memories. Uh, here's an example here of an of a Inuktitut language translation memory. Uh, that's searching bilingual government documents. Okay, and Graham tells me that every every uh, week you get a little bit about a new language, right? 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about actually a group of languages, but with with examples from one. Um, so in um, in North America, there are many uh, distinct cultural regions, and and. A uh, notable one is the uh, Pacific Coastal Rainforest of the Pacific Northwest, uh, the, what's sometimes called the Cascadia bioregion. And this is an area very rich in food resources, especially salmon and other seafood. And the richness of the sea and the land supports a really high diversity of cultures and languages. Uh, so when we talk about a culture area, we're not talking about a single culture, uh, but an area where many distinct cultures nonetheless have a number of cultural traits in common. So think of the Mediterranean. Uh, you wouldn't mistake Morocco for Greece or Spain from Israel, but because of similar ecosystems, long histories of trade, um, and 10,000 years of contact, there are a lot of cultural commonalities between the cultures of these regions and the languages of these regions. And the same is true along the waterways of the Pacific Northwest. So if you've never been to the Pacific Northwest, um, here's a very representative photo of the coastal temperate rainforest. And these waterways are central to the indigenous cultures, both because they are a very rich source of food and also because they're a rapid transit system. They, uh, with these waterways and a canoe, you can actually uh, get around fairly fast. And after 10,000 years of that contact, you get uh, cultures and languages that actually share a lot. So just as cultures have similarities, um, even though they're not the same culture, the same is true of the languages. And where a number of unrelated languages uh, nonetheless share a lot of features, uh, that's called a language area or a Sprachbund. So um, along the coast of Cascadia, you get a Sprachbund consisting of several unrelated language families, including the Lukashian languages and the Salishan languages, uh, and the Tsimshianic languages that all share a lot of um, interesting features that aren't necessarily shared outside of that region. And some of these pose distinct challenges when making technology. I'll mostly illustrate these features in Kwakwala. It's the um, language that I know best of Canadian indigenous languages. And it's a northern Wakashian language. It's spoken on northern Vancouver Island and adjacent regions. Um, it's a comparatively well-documented language. Uh, there's been a history of recording it in, in sound and text going back uh, more than 120 years. And it's a highly complex language that's very difficult to learn if you grew up only speaking English. Um, I'll illustrate some of those features, but I also want to take care not to exoticize them. Uh, Kwakwala is an entirely learnable and speakable language. Uh, it's just very different than English. Um, so one notable feature of Northwest languages in general is that they tend to have extensive consonant inventories. Uh, it's not unusual for languages to have 35 or 40 different consonants. And you can you can picture if you're a second language learner or if, if you're a speech recognition system, uh, how difficult it might be to tell the difference between, say, tla and tla uh, versus tla and tla. Um, there's a lot of different uh, sounds in these languages, especially that can be confused for k, uh, ka and ka and ka and ka. And ga and ha, 
and, and so on. And so this pro poses problems with both for second language learners and for uh, systems that process sound or text. Also, in addition to having lots of consonants, uh, many of these languages like to put a lot of consonants together. Uh, Kwakwala is not the best uh, illustration of this feature, so I'm illustrating this with the language in uh, which is an interior Salish language. Uh, so in Inchakchin, the phrase meaning today is um, so you can, you can imagine the problems if you're a second language learner or a speech recognition system or a speech synthesis system uh, encountering words like this. Yeah, I mean, you can learn this. I, I learned this. Um, but there is additional difficulty here. So the large confident continent of Victoria and the complex clusters make these languages in particular difficult to transcribe. Um, it's not that these are unwritten languages. Uh, Kwakwala's had about six main orthographies from 1900. Uh, it's more that there's a lot of disagreement uh, about what characters to assign to which of these sounds, um, how exactly you write certain distinctive sequences of sounds into letters. Um, and even aside for, from orthographic disagreements, uh, it really matters who transcribed the language because they run into different difficulties with transcription. So learners have sometimes learned an official orthography at school. Um, but like many second language learners, they sometimes have trouble hearing, for example, the difference between ka and ka. I mean, it sounds obvious when I say it like that, but actually when it's said in a word, it can be hard to figure out which one was said. Um, on the other hand, if, if you're an elder and you grew up speaking this language, you have no problem at all distinguishing ka and ka, uh, but you probably didn't encounter learning to write the language in a formal educational context, and you might not know the way that different orthographies render these two sounds differently, even though you can hear the difference. Um, so it matters what orthography a person is using. It matters whether they're a learner or a speaker. Uh, it matters what keyboard they're using. Uh, which soft keyboard did they download for Windows or Mac, or are they on Android? Uh, So you, you often can't predict how a user will render something. And different sources may use different conventions and may not be consistent in themselves. The n-gram distribution of your corpus may be quite different than your dictionary. And both of those may be different than the actual user inputs that people who use your system enter. Um, so you have to be prepared that whenever you're working on very low resource languages, that you kind of have to treat every document as if it might be its own language. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm so pleased you're researching multilingual NLP. Um, the standardization where you can necessarily predict exactly how a word's going to be rendered in Unicode is an artifact of media consolidation and nationalized education. The real linguistic world is multilingual all the way down. And by developing systems that can handle both Spanish and Portuguese, uh, you're probably also developing systems that can handle the level of variation that real non-national text shows. Um, so, so keep at that, I am pleased. <laughs> um, going on to more morphosyntactic stuff, uh, Pacific Northwest languages typically have a lot of inclusives. Uh, that means that small words, you know, like the or of, attach 
in speech and sometimes even in writing to nearby words. So Kwaku shows this uh, systematically. Pretty much all small words in the language systematically modify the following word. Um, but they are phonologically pronounced as if they attach to the previous word. So tsowoch pate hahana sagwada. Sagwada is actually a syntactic unit. Um, hahana is actually a syntactic unit. These will move together if you rearrange the sentence. Um, but hanasa is pronounced together and patecha is pronounced together. Uh, this is another source of orthographic variation in documents that's often not talked about, is that different sources disagree about things like whether ha should be written as a separate word. In fact, within a single document, um, within stuff that I've written, uh, ha is sometimes attached to the previous word and sometimes it isn't. So Kwakula and other languages of the Pacific Northwest are high in morphological complexity. Words tend to be made up of multiple independently meaningful parts. This is in itself a Sprachbund feature. It's actually quite common in North American languages. And Northwest languages are actually not near the extreme of this, this continuum. They're, they're pretty in the middle. But there's still considerable complexity if your point of reference is English or French or Chinese. Uh, so a word like kakotratsi is not an individual unit. That's actually made of four to six morphemes um, together. And the, the derivational process by which this word is built is itself very complex. So in each case, as you add a suffix, things can change also in the stem that you added it to. So this suffix looks simple. It just looks like adding an ah, uh, um, but it actually does several different changes. It reduplicates the root, it splits o into a uh, and u, it turns ta at the end of that word into ta. So th there's a complex derivational process that creates new words. Uh, and in addition to that, there are, um, if, oh, uh, another, another uh, rather unique feature of the Pacific Northwest languages is in, Many of the world's languages, the range of meanings that a suffix can have is rather abstract. That suffixes tend to say, put something into the past tense or negate it or make it plural. Um, and the Wakashan and Salishan languages, uh, especially the Wakashan languages, have suffixes that have extremely concrete meanings. Um, as specific as something like to do a verb X in an outward direction while standing in a canoe. And there are about 400 of these. Um, they're not roots, they're not independent words. You can't say them on their own. Um, they really only add to roots. Um, but large parts of the vocabulary of Kwakwa are combining a root for say an action um, like um, yuk, yuk is to, to knit. So yagatsi is knitting basket, hollow vessel associated with knitting. And wool is yagalas, input material to knitting. Um, Also, there are systematic and sectional differences uh, in what features do you have to mark on verbs and nouns uh, in order to put them into a sentence. So unlike European languages, uh, gender is unmarked. I think I remember that none of the Pacific Northwest coastal languages have grammatical gender marking. Uh, and tense is option, often optional. So in Kwakula, uh, you have to mark future tense, but I don't think you're required to distinguish between present and past tense unless you want to. 
Meanwhile, however, the relative location of the subject with respect to the speaker is obligatorily marked um, and whether or not they're visible uh, when, what, in the speech context. So you actually say something like, Roland is my boss differently depending on whether Roland's in the room with me or not. So if you're working multilingually between Pacific Northwest and European languages, be, be prepared that actually most of the inflections of between the two groups of languages will have no counterpart in the other language. Anyway, in conclusion, um, Wakashian languages in particular are sometimes exaggerated as if they're impossibly complex, like unspeakably complex. Um, I, I used to believe that um, until I learned Kwakwa. And I wanna emphasize that Kwakwa is an entirely speakable language. Uh, it makes a lot of sense when you learn it. And often the way, that, the way you put things is more straightforward and makes more sense than in English. Oh, and when I mentioned this to elders, they agree. <laughs> They go, oh, I'm so glad someone said it. English is weird. Uh, it's just very different from European languages along most possible dimensions. And just as a note of historical interest, uh, Kwakwa'a was one of the key languages that knocked down uh, the European racist linguistics of like a evolutionary development from primitive tribal languages to like Latin. Because uh, there's no way to seriously study Kwakwa'a and come away with the notion that this is a primitive or undeveloped language. It's just as complex as Latin or Hebrew, but it's really different in almost every way that it could be different. And um, case studies like this um, are one of the things that helped convince the uh, European intellectual world that languages from the rest of the world were as rich and as complex systems of grammar and meaning as European languages. Um, anyway, that's, that's language time for today. Um, I'm actually gonna briefly stop to get a drink and let you ask any questions you might have. Yeah, this, this, this was great. Are, are there any uh, questions that people had that you'd like to ask? You can do either chat or, uh, or if you just want to ask directly. I have a question. How did you learn Kwakwala? Like how do people, what are the resources available to people who, to learn these languages? Um, <clears throat> so I, I largely learned this teacher, learned this uh, language from uh, teachers. Um, uh, an elder in Vancouver and an elder in Victoria and a couple classes with elders in Port Hardy, British Columbia. And Largely just once a week, I would drive to their house and we'd sit there with a microphone and some cups of tea and I would ask, how do you say this? How do you say this? And then um, go back home and work out the patterns. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this language, um, there is a textbook series. Um, I don't exactly know where you would get it. And it kind of only goes up to the elementary level. Um, if you'd like to learn about it um, from a sort of linguistic point of view, I recommend reading my PhD dissertation if you have a lot of time because it's 600 pages long. Um, but I, I am told it's highly readable. Uh, so you're welcome. Google my name and, and thesis and um, you, you might even enjoy it. Um, Okay, thanks. But this, this is taught in schools. Um, if you were, for example, going to high school uh, at one of the local schools in this region, um, Kwakwa is offered as an elective. Um, 
I've sat in in a couple of the classes. So the so the the ways that are available to learn this language do differ according to you know whether you're growing up in the Kwakwakiwak culture or you're like me, uh, outsider. So I, I had uh, this is is fascinating, and you know normally we have this language in ten where people who have studied about it uh, for you know a few uh, like um, you know uh, on the resources they find and explain about it, and um, or, or you know they speak the language but haven't necessarily thought about it linguistically. Um, and it, it's obvious that you wrote a 600 page dissertation on this because it was uh, it, it was an amazing you know contrast and uh, I, I had one question which was um, like the you mentioned the phonetic and the syntactic phrases being different um, like how do, does that work? Um, I guess my, my concept of a syntactic phrase is that you move it within the sentence and you could have like, for example, a noun phrase after either a verb phrase in English, for example, a noun phrase after a, a verb uh, is an object or like a coordinate clause where you have a noun phrase and a noun phrase or something like this. So it seems like it would be hard to connect at least from my maybe biased version of English, it'd be hard to connect like a suffix onto like a coordinating conjunction and on a onto a verb, depending on like the context in which that phrase appears. So how how does that work? Um, most mostly, it's not a whole lot harder than doing it in English. Um, you know, kind of in your mind there. Not that I'm fluent, not that I can necessarily say what a speaker does, but um, syntactically, you do kind of treat them as independent words, even though they glom onto whatever comes previous. Um, they're a lot like apostrophe, uh, the possessive apostrophe S in English, where it's like Frankenstein's hat, the bride of Frankenstein's hat, um, the the Bride of Frankenstein's that I talk to's hat, um, where that, that S can actually occur next to absolutely any kind of part of speech, despite the fact in each of these cases it belonged to the first thing there. Um, it only gets particularly complicated when due to like complex center embedding, you get a bunch of these all piling up um, and so, for example, for people that are making, say, like FSTs for Quackola, one of the big questions is actually, what is the possible variation of things that can stack up here? Because they can occur in text, um, but it's, it's, it's quite difficult to think about what can actually pile up in one place. Um, Tanmay had an interesting question. Uh, do we see patterns of code switching? Um, so yes, and it, it depends on the language. Um, for example, uh, Quackola, uh does do a lot of borrowing from other languages. There's a lot of English loanwords in it, and you can relatively effortlessly switch and use a um, English or European word in the middle of it. Um, in fact, you can, you can then add on these suffixes and enclitics onto whole English phrases. Um, for example, there's an enclitic that comes out as like so-called. Um, and so like at one point we're, we're trying to figure out how something is going to be written and I'm like, hey man, is that normal A or underlined A? And the elder just goes, normal you know I don't know about this normal a you guys are talking about um, 
In other languages, it's different. For example, in Algonquian languages, I'm told that you're much more likely to coin a new word corresponding to the English phrase um, and use that rather than just put in a borrowing. Um, so so in, this, in the same way that English is a borrower and German is a coiner, um, these languages differ a lot. Um, are there any aspects that are more efficient in these languages than English or French? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of times um, where English feels very paraphrastic in terms of like the number of words you have to use to express something and like the way you go around things. Um, let me think of one. Oh, uh, okay, like um, in Quaquila, Actions are verbs much more than they are in English. There's actually a lot of things that are actually actions in English that we treat as nouns, like war. War is something you do, but it's a noun in English. Uh, sex is something you do, but it's a noun in English. Um, English is something you do, but it's a noun in English. Um, we have to say, make war, have sex, speak English. And in Kwakula, these are all verbs. Uh, the word quaquila is a ver is a grammatical verb, and it means um, to sound like a member of the quaggular tribe. Um, so all language names in this in this language are verbs. So that's just a minor example, but um, th there are many cases where they they really have a specific verb, or there is a lexical suffix that captures a whole lot of very useful meaning just, just by sticking it on a verb. Anyway, let's, uh, I, I want to get a quick drink, but uh, then we'll move on to the second half. That last one was pretty fascinating as well for for me. I, I'd not heard of uh, not heard of that, but uh, yeah, Pat. I, I was just saying the last one was uh, was quite fascinating as well um, because you know it's so it's so different from English, but it's also so logical at the same time. You know, like uh, so. Pat, yeah, what about the word love? Is it a verb or a noun? It is a verb. <laughs> That's cool. Um. This is one thing uh, that's very common among languages of North America, which is the concentration on verbs. Um, most roots denote actions and many verbs are derivations of them. And more of the sentence is about sort of inflecting the verb in a very specific way rather than arranging nouns. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is um, in Algonquian languages, uh, weather conditions are all verbs, um, but also days of the week are work verbs, and months are verbs, uh, and they're actually the same class of verbs as weather conditions. So you actually say it's Tuesday. So in most languages, loan words are nouns. What about uh, the can loan words? Um, that's also true in Kwakula. Most loan words in Quaquil are nouns. Great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to a, another uh, part of the discussion, and this is a bit of uh, it's a bit of show and tell, and a bit of talking about my job, and a bit of ranting. Okay. So as I said before, I work for the National Research Council of Canada. This is a good time for the standard disclaimer. Uh, these are only my opinions as a researcher. Nothing I say here is policy or promised by the government of Canada. Uh, 
So the National Research Council of Canada is the primary research branch of the Canadian federal government. Uh, and it's tasked with helping Canadian organizations maintain a research edge, especially when they're faced with a scientific or technological frontier beyond the scope of that organization's research capability. So like, picture if you're a coastal town beset by hurricanes, you want to build some breakers in the bay to protect your town. Um, but you probably don't have an oceanographic research center in your town, uh, but NRC does, and you can partner with NRC to do the simulations to determine where to put those breakers. Or um, NRC is the organization that invented canola oil. Uh, so a very major Canadian industry um, that we always brag about as um, one of our greatest accomplishments. So it's, it's help businesses uh, find, for example, ec the economic niches of the future uh, that are going to employ future Canadians. So the uh, 2017 federal budget tasked NRC with assisting indigenous language community with technology R&D. Um, just as there's an oceanographic research institute, there's a research center devoted to digital technologies that I work for, and we have people on staff who are experts in natural language processing. And so we were asked um, to assist indigenous teachers and organizations. Uh, and I have to emphasize that this assistance is not coming uh, into an empty land technological landscape. Um, if, if, if you mostly read like star ACL articles, a lot of times low resource languages, technology is described in the future tense. Like someday this research may lead to people having technology in their own language. Um, there's actually a lot out there. Um, it's just not necessarily published uh, in star ACL journals. Sometimes the people that make it aren't academics and aren't under pressure to publish. Other times it's not technologically novel and therefore uh, ACL type journal uh, proceedings is not the appropriate venue for its publication. Anyway, there's a lot already out there. Many communities do already have websites. Uh, some of them have recording studios, language archives. Uh, sometimes they've partnered with organizations like 7,000 Languages to make computer-aided language learning apps for iOS and Android and, and desktop. Um, and some of these web archives tools are smart in the sense that they use NLP methods um, like stemming or approximate search to give users more appropriate results. Uh, if you'd like a survey to see sort of like what is out there for a, one country, um, I did a survey of this a couple years ago. Um, but beyond the core technologies like that, if your organization is facing a problem and you think the answer might be speech synthesis or speech recognition, uh, most indigenous language organizations aren't large enough to have dedicated tech research branches of their own. Uh, and that's when you can uh, collaborate with NRC. So typically an organization will approach us, approach us with a set of problems they face, and we identify one of these as a good fit for collaboration. Uh, particularly when solving that problem for the particular organization would mean reduced development time for, let's see, I've got a question. Uh, would mean reduced development time for other organizations in the same situation. And like uh, a problem that once you've solved it once, you're very close to solving it for other languages. Uh, and that's, that's a way that we try to combine specificity with generality. Uh, you know, we don't want to go too far and become the de dedicated developers for just one organization. That wouldn't be fair to the others. Um, but we also don't want to only solve pure research questions. Um, like we don't want to solve um, abstract questions faced by imaginary people. 
Um, so this is how we try to do that balance. So like just for some show and tell, here's one of our earliest projects. Um, so the Ongowena Gundolkwa Immersion School for the Mohawk Language is phenomenal. Uh, my opinion is one of the most impressive language schools I've ever uh, encountered. And they're, they're really good at creating speakers, like people who can genuinely speak these languages. Um, and teachers at the school however, uh, felt that they were spending a lot of their out of class time answering like sort of one off student queries. Like what is the this particular conjugation of this verb I can't I can't figure it out myself. Um, so they knew they needed a reference work. But like they couldn't just publish a Becherel or you know like 101 Mohawk verbs book. Um, the Mohawk verb conjugation system is extremely complex. Uh, there's thousands of possible conjugations in every verb, and the book would just be unprintably huge. Um, they suspected that you could do this as an interactive website. Um, but this is an organization of teachers. It's not an organization of computer programmers. Uh, so they reached out to my colleague, Dr. Anna Kazantseva, about making a grammar model for their language that students could interact with online. Um, and this is an entirely feasible project, even in a zero resource situation. Uh, if you have teachers that you can ask questions to, you can make one of these without any data. Um, if you want to know how, take grammars and lexicons from Lori and Terrico. They'll show you how to do it. It's fun. Uh, and the result is the website that you see on the right here. Uh, it offers a lot of different interactive visualizations of the process of the verb system, and you can look up thousands of verbs with it. But these project, what makes these projects interesting is the back and forth, is the, the delivery and the feedback and the re-delivery and so on. And so um, one response was, you know, it, this is great. We love it. Um, but we're trying to train speakers, not just readers, writers. So the system comes up with a 25 letter word that's the conjugation of this form. And the student may never have encountered a form like that before. Can you make it talk? Like, can you have it so that it like can pronounce every word? And the teachers understood this was a tall order. Like they, they also understood that you could never manage to record every conjugation of every verb. They'd be at it for the rest of their lives. Uh, but this is a great domain for text-to-speech. Uh, unit selection text-to-speech requires less data than you might think it does. Um, we actually use, we use Allen's system for it. And the reason this is such a good fit for text-to-speech is this is a speech domain that we can characterize in its entirety. It's the output of a generative system that we just wrote. Uh, so we can actually find the prompts uh, that we can guarantee give you full coverage of the domain. And um, so this teacher here, I think that's uh, Runaway de Osta, um, is in the process of recording the limited number of verb forms necessary to generate the others. And he's willing to do that because he understands that the time he's taking now to record is gonna save him a lot of time in the future. Uh, and that return on investment is something that you should, you should always have in mind uh, when you're asking a busy professional like him to, to do stuff for you. So you might object, Pat, this is pretty old fashioned stuff. Um, and yes, that's true. I, I give you a picture there of one of my technological heroes, uh, Nintendo R&D one head, Gunpei Yokoi, uh, inventor of the Game Boy, uh, whose emphasis was, was always, what are, what are interesting things I can do with reliable commodity technology? Uh, that no one has ever done before. So yes, um, 
a lot of the um, models that we use are the same models that were used 20 years ago uh, on English. And, but in this situation, reliability is really important. Um, if we deployed a neural system that gets the right answer like 75% of the time and like 10% of the time is superhumanly good, but like 20% of the time it generates, you know, neural fabricated garbage, that can be deeply inappropriate in this kind of educational situation because students aren't able to catch when it's lying. Um, and actually, um, every time I mention this, someone in the audience in industry comes up to me afterward and is like, yeah, thanks for, thanks for telling the truth here. Um, there's a lot more rule-based stuff out there, especially when it fulfills a core business case. Like, you don't want to learn your core business case by following the gradient of angry customers at launch. Um, you, you, you want to make sure you get the core business case right at launch and then incorporate machine learning once, once it's proven itself. Um, also, these, these tried and true algorithms work well on the data scale that we're faced with. Um, because indigenous languages spoken in Canada have vastly different levels of available data resources. And that can lead to some pitfalls in project choice that we try to avoid. Um, to give you an example of the scale, uh, one language, Inuktitut, has a 1.3 million sentence parallel corpus with English, uh, largely because it's been the language of a government for 20 years, and there are 20 years of parliamentary proceedings in it. Um, on the opposite end of the scale, some languages have no publicly available data. Um, probably the median language has a word list available, you know, a couple hundred words with their English equivalents, and maybe a CD of children's stories. Um, and sometimes an organization has private data. There's, you know, sometimes they're hesitant to share it outside of a longer term relationship. Um, so just, just to sort of illustrate um, the different perspective that uh, someone in my situation has to do in terms of um, product cho uh, project choice. So you know, picture hundreds of languages in multiple countries. And if you're sort of a freelance NLP researcher and you're asking what languages should you work on, the answer is usually obvious. I'm going to work on the languages that have the scale and type of data resources I need to do the kind of research I do. So if I uh, research neural machine translation, I'm looking for languages that are beyond a certain scale of available by text. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I mean, that's, that's what you need to do. Um, but on the other hand, um, if your job is particularly to, to serve the people of a particular country, um, applying the same choice algorithm is actually, um, can, can be inappropriate. Um, the limit government support to the two languages that already have the most stuff. Um, that exacerbates the existing inequality. It's a, it's a rich get richer situation. Um, so it's not bad to work on these languages. I'm not trying to dissuade you from working on Inuktitut. Um, in fact, I have many colleagues who only work on Inuktitut, uh, particularly because the government of Nunavut has distinct needs that stem from Inuktitut being the language of government. And thus there are people devoted to the problems that they face. Um, so it's not bad to work on these languages. Um, but in terms of um, what, do, what kind of projects do I want to promote uh, when I'm promoting projects, I'm especially looking for those that sort of lift all ships, where most of the benefit may be to a nuctitude, but aspects of the system could be used for other languages as well. Um, but 
like to illustrate this, um, picture me doing a show and tell a lot like I'm doing right now um, to potential uh, communities who are interested in, in what we can do for them. So I say, here's some great new, you know, super smart, great looking technology from like our genius collaborators at CMU. Oh man, awesome, I love it. Will this work in my language? No. This is, this is a terrible conversation to have and I try to avoid it whenever possible. Um, and the conversation even gets worse because then they ask, well, why not? And I end up having to kind of explain basic machine learning to, to explain it. And the, if the answer comes down to, uh, you can't have this technology because we don't have enough resources, that's particularly disappointing to the audience because the reason they came to talk with us in the first place is because they're, they're busy professionals trying to take on a huge job without enough resources to do it. And they're coming to see if I can be of help to that. Uh, and so I don't want to give the answer, no, I can't help you until you have more resources. Um, so I'm always on the lookout for projects where I can confidently say yes. When at the end of the presentation, someone goes, will this work in my language? I can say, yes, that's a great feeling. And I think there are things that many of you can probably do to your projects to make it more likely that I can say yes at the end of this conversation. Um, so questions that I ask of new projects um, that, for example, I might get involved in. Are there benefits for even lower resource languages than the language that the project was originally intended for? Like we don't expect a system to work as well for say Quaquila as it would for Inuktitut. Like, it doesn't do anything. Or when you're deploying a, a system in the real world, like you, you devote developer hours to that and they make some kind of interface. Um, can parts of that interface be used even if the AI powering them isn't quite as smart? Or can they be reused for a related question that you can do in that less resource language? Um, so part of this presentation is just me talking about projects that I love. And one of those is the idea of autocomplete for translators. Uh, this research, for example, happening at Johns Hopkins University by Rebecca Knowles, now at NRC, um, or uh, happening in Monaji Choudhury's lab at Microsoft India. So instead of conditioning the decoder solely on previous predictions, uh, it's conditioned on the human's input so far, and the predictions are offered as autocomplete suggestions. Um, why do I like this? Well, the failure case of neural machine translation are often failures of adequacy rather than failures of fluency. So cases where the decoder is presumably not getting a lot of meaningful signal from the encoder, and then just kind of goes off and does, it, does its own thing, you know, fabricates its own story based on what has come before. You know, uh, so th the failure case of NMT is just a pretty much just an autoregressive language model. That's still pretty useful for autocomplete. I can, I can imagine translators working in Quaquila would be happy for a reasonably smart autocomplete system, um, even if it has low adequacy as a translation system. Um, put another way, the failure case of autocomplete for translators is autocomplete. And autocomplete is still something I'm happy, you know, getting up there and saying, um, you can have it. Um, so you can think of systems like this in terms of a continuum. And on the side of medium resource languages like Inuktitut, you have you know, full, sometimes nearly human quality MT output coming out of the system. And at the very other end of the scale, 
where it's a language where all they really have is an online word list. You know, a unigram language model providing autocomplete suggestions. Um, that's a gamut where actually the whole, the whole gamut has some benefit to somebody. Um, and that's one of the reasons I like this. Uh, it, it, it's couching a known problem within a paradigm that goes all the way from nearly zero shot to high resource. Oh, I skip question two. Question three. Um, how much work will the client have to invest to adapt this to their language? Uh, so just, you know, being honest with you, you personally are probably not going to adapt your system to 70 plus languages. Um, you'll, you'll probably, even in a multilingual system, you're probably looking at no more than 10. Um, so beyond the point where you are directly involved in this, like once you've got your publication and you've got a job and you're moving on, uh, beyond that, it's largely going to be clients' jobs to take that system and adapt it to their language if they want it. Um, so that raises the question, is the adaptation that this system requires the kind of work that an educated layperson can actually do? Um, our clients are generally technologically adept people. Um, these, these are people who sought us out for technology, technology development. They're usually real into technology. Uh, but they're usually not computer scientists, and a lot of them aren't in a position to sort of embark on a second career. Um, so in systems where adapt this system to a new language means something like fill out this spreadsheet, I can predict a rich afterlife for this system continuing to be adapted to new and more languages once the original developers have moved on. Um, if adapting something to a new language means, you know, clone our GitHub and fix the following variables and functions until it compiles. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but it's not a system that I'm going to predict is going to have a very rich afterlife after you've moved on. Um, on the flip side, um, well, Clients are usually not computer scientists. Um, they're often fairly linguistically sophisticated. These are, you know, in practice, a lot of the organizations that you work with in a low resource world are organizations dedicated to language and language education. Uh, someone on staff probably has a linguistics degree. Um, even if they don't, they probably know a lot about the language. And if you need linguistic terminology, they probably are friends with a linguist. Uh, so you can ask them for linguistic facts. You can ask them for things like, what's the sound inventory of your language in the international phonetic alphabet? Um, at note, um, many clients don't in practice have this bare cycles to embark on a, like a year long annotation effort just for your project. Um, they could, but remember they're very busy people. So, Think hard about the return on investment on the labor that they might be putting into it. Um, are you keeping them from doing something that actually would, would get more done in the long term? Um, and clients have been around the block and they're wary of linguistic black holes. They're wary of enthusiastic outsiders who say, if you give me all of this stuff, I'm going to come back to you with something awesome whether they're a linguist promising a dictionary or a programmer promising a app or something like that. And, and they're used to projects that endlessly collect data but never manage to um, deliver. I mean, that's, that's most projects in the world. Um, but that's why there's sometimes some um, suspicion about handing over the keys to the kingdom at the beginning. Um, a lot of times, this isn't this isn't due to malice by the by the linguist or the programmer. It's 
Um, funding situations change, people move on, people get different jobs. Um, they get different enthusiasms. Uh, so a lot of times, if your project needs data that doesn't exist yet, your best bet is to sort of work alongside an existing data collection effort and say, um, and like make sure that the stuff they're collecting is also stuff that you can use for whatever kind of project you're doing. So another project that I love is Allosource. It's a, a project uh, primarily by one of your fellow students. Is, is Xinjiang still a student? Yep. Um, so I love this project. And uh, you heard a little bit about it in one of your previous lectures, but it's a, it's a zero shot phonetic transcription uh, system that uses multilingually trained neural networks combined in, in a clever architecture with human written or human collected phonology resources. Some of them explicitly written for this purpose um, and some already existing. So why do I like it? The resources that the system wants are entirely reasonable for clients to provide. Like what is the phonetic inventory of your language? Or what are all the possible sounds in IPA that correspond to the different letters in your language? Um, every, every organization I've ever worked with could answer those questions. Um, and also as, as with the autocomplete, it does do something even when its preferred resources are unavailable. So the, I'm very excited about the zero shot frontier uh, in speech in part because it completely flips the script when it comes to deliverables. It's not a case of a community has to pony up a ton of data at the outset for a nebulous deliverable. Like I wouldn't have to say I'm the creators. I wouldn't have to go in and say, okay, I need a hundred transcribed hours of speech. And then in a year or two, I might get back to you with a system that might suck. Um, the systems that can at least operate zero shot completely flip the script. Cause I can say, hey, I don't need to see any of your data. Um, I, why don't you tell me what the sounds of your language is and next week, I'll deliver you a system um, without having seen your data. And yeah, the system might suck. Like the system might perform poorly, but if you like it and you think that this has promise in your organization, then later we can talk about whether we want to enter into a data sharing agreement. And it totally flips the script and it establishes, you know, my team as a team that can deliver. And that goes a long way to um, you know, establishing trust between organizations. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about zero shot uh, possibilities. I also think this um, illustrates a promising general approach. I call these hybrid transfer models. I don't know if there's a better word. Um, I see these called uh, zebra models. Uh, Yu Hong Guo, I think, um, coined that term. Uh, but they're problems that can be characterized in terms of two things. Uh, there's a output probability, probability distribution of interest that you can find in one or more donor languages. That might be a cross-linguistic acoustic model, uh, or it could be an English acoustic model. Uh, or it could be the kind of world model that BERT or GPT-3 seems to learn. Um, and then um, we can also characterize it in terms of a knowledge-based transformation, like a rule-based transformation or a transformation based on pre-collected priors in between the distribution th that we got from the previous step and the distribution in the target language. Uh, and this is, this is an example of one of those situations. 
Uh, and I like it because we can get both of those things. We can get the cross-linguistic distribution and we can also easily elicit the second thing from humans. Uh, I so this is, I think, one of the really viable paths towards ML-like systems on languages where we don't have and we're unlikely to get the kind of parallel data that you need to learn a transformation. And I think there are a lot of architectural configurations that do this, and I think some of them have not been tried. So if you're into this, you know, hit me up, we'll brainstorm. Uh, here's another example. Um, so this is, this is a project that I, I do a lot of work on. And the, a very old fashioned method of zero shot forced alignment on a new language is often achieved through a um, similar means. You have an acoustic model trained on some donor language or languages, and you have a rule-based conversion from target language graphemes to donor language frames. And so you take the target language document, you convert it to donor language phonemes, and you force align it using the donor acoustic model. Like that is old fashioned, reliable. Um, but I want to point out that it actually illustrates a general architecture that we can think about. So one in which we train to the distribution of interest, and then we convert the thing we're trying to do at inference time into that distribution of interest. And then another model would be, you know, get the distribution of interest, convert it to the target distribution. Uh, and there's things like Allosaurus does where that is actually done as neural network layers that we can back propagate through. So I, I think there's a lot of different architectures that achieve this, including some things that we do all the time. Um, so this is straightforward and it works, um, but we actually observed that doing it is tricky if you don't have a very specific educational background. Like if you, if you didn't come out of kind of the CMU Edinburgh speech world, there's actually a lot of sort of undocumented lore about how you do this uh, that, that makes it tricky if you aren't, for example, David Huggins Danes. Um, luckily, one of the people on our project is David Huggins Danes. So, um, so this is um, a project to automate the creation of the cross linguistic G to P to make it easier and quicker for non David Huggins Daneses to adapt it to new languages. And basically, it's a mashup of PanFon and Pocket Sphinx. Uh, so I, I want to show you the results. OK, so I, and I want to emphasize that was made zero shot. Uh, this system has never heard Kedan Zibia National by M1 before. That is the first document it ever encountered in that language. And but this is a domain that we can characterize in terms of those two things. Um, you know, both a thing that we can find with the data in the languages that we can have, and a rule-based transformation that we can reasonably elicit from non-experts. Um, so I'm going to have to skip a lot of my show and tell, but um, in conclusion, you know, I'm excited by, by some of the work that's been coming out of CMU lately, things like Allosaurus, because I think we're very close to a new frontier of very low resource language technology. Um, not solving every problem, but solving a lot of problems that can be characterized in terms of a cross-linguistic model and rule-based adaptations or human prior-based adaptations using resources that client organizations can reasonably provide, using formats and domain-specific languages that lay people can actually read and maintain and modify. Um, and that has the add-on benefit that the system remains under their long-term control when their needs change, when the orthography changes, when they want to add new verbs or something like that. Um, 
So just some possible discussion questions and I can stick around if, if you really wanna talk and brainstorm with me. You know, I'd love to hear what you're working on and I'd love to brainstorm with you ways in which the systems that you're working on might be modified so that like aspects of the interface can be reused so they can be used on problems from a continuum of NLP tasks. Um, ways to couch your system so that when it fails, it fails in unobtrusive and unobjectionable ways uh, so, that, uh, so that it's more appropriate to do in education. Um, ways that we can find reasonable fallbacks when a preferred resource is unavailable. So the thing that I just showed you used a handwritten G2P for, um, for Anishinaabe Bemwin, but if that was unavailable, the system actually still works because it has some, uh, it uses text Unicode to look up the pronunciation of symbols from the Unicode table. Um, or ways that the adaptation process can be streamlined in ways that a non-computer scientist could do it. And um, so I, I hope that that gives you some, some neat brainstorms. Um, if it does, um, absolutely contact me. It's just first name dot last name at nrc.gc.ca um, or just say, Graham, introduce me to Pat. Um, and I, I really look forward to your future careers because uh, this is a really unexplored landscape that, that I think you, you may be able to, to pioneer some new land in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pat. That was great and really, really insightful. I think, you know, a lot of people have uh, things to think about now. So 